Yeah. And so, Father, as we turn to your word, would you come right now, Lord? Holy Spirit, would you anoint my lips with your words, that it would not be me, but you this morning. Come and have your way, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I'm really excited, especially after the 40 days that we've spent in the Word and learning some of the, the ways to study the Bible. I'm excited to share this message with you because some of those observations I've applied. So I learned something. Anybody else learn anything? Oh, yeah, look at that. <clears throat> right. Now, this, the most incredible thing happens on Good Fridays. We do something that looks very strange to other people. Have you ever thought of it? We appear to remember and to celebrate one of the most cruel, the most agonizing and torturous death that evil men could dream up. And it's called crucifixion on a cross. You know, crucifixion on the cross was designed so that the person experiencing that or suffering that would go through a long, slow, painful death, sometimes lasting many days. That that person would suffer the humiliation of hanging on that cross naked out in public where everybody could see them. And it was designed to be a deterrent, a warning against all sorts of criminals. Mm. No, I'm not going to go there. <laughs> because here's what happens. Once you were sentenced to crucifixion, you picked up your crossbeam because the post was still hanging there. Uh, the, the post was set in the ground at Golgotha. You picked up your crossbeam of that cross that was set aside for you. And at that point, there were no lawyers to represent you. There were no appeals against it. There wasn't even waiting on death row. There was no survival. There was only pain. And then you died. That was called crucifixion. You know, the cross and everything that it represents, everything that it represents to Christians, what it does is it, it laser focuses our attention on this most essential moment in the history of mankind, the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so, yes, we remember and we celebrate the death of Jesus on the cross today. And why? Because we know it's not the end of the story. As that old preacher once said, it's Friday, but Sunday's coming. You see, the cross and the crucifixion, they are central to our Christian belief. Once we get to that place where we've accepted Jesus as our Savior, the cross is where our old Life, our worldly life comes to an end and there's a reversal. There's a turning away from how we used to live. And now we live every day with Jesus. And so I want to share four observations uh, and thoughts that I had about the cross and the impact that this has about our life that I see in the verses we're going to read in a few moments. Now, I know there are more, but I was reminded very clearly that this is not a three-hour service. <laughs> and I won't go into the length of some other sermons we've gone through. As we, re <laughs> As we read through the scriptures, see how many points 
you observe as well. Come on, there's a challenge. So we're going to be reading from Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 50. Quite a number of verses. Right? Matthew chapter 27, verses 27 to 50. Then the governor's soldiers took Jesus to the praetorium and gathered the whole company of soldiers around him. They stripped him and they put a scarlet robe on him. Then they twisted together a, th a crown of thorns and they set it on its head. They put a staff in his right hand and then they knelt in front of him and they mocked him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. They spat on him. And then they took the staff and they struck him on the head again and again. And after they had mocked him, they took off the robe and put his own clothes on him and they led him away to crucify him. As they were going out, they met a man from Cyrene named Simon and they forced him to carry the cross. They came to a place called Golgotha, which means the place of the skull. And there they offered Jesus wine to drink, mixed with gall. But after tasting it, he refused to drink it. Pause. Wine mixed with gall was an anesthetic, right? It helped the person on the cross not to feel as much. Jesus says he wants to feel everything. When they had crucified him, they divided up his clothes by casting lots. And after sitting down, they kept watch over him there. And above his head, they placed the written charge against him. This is Jesus, the King of the Jews. Two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right and one on his left, and those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, You, who are going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the Son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. He saved others, they said but he can't save himself. He's the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants him. For he said, I am the son of God. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came on the land. About three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing there heard this, they said, He's calling Elijah. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. And when Jesus had cried out again in a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. The mental, the emotional, and the spiritual torture had ended for Jesus. You know, they did not kill him. Jesus chose to die for all our sins. And in choosing weakness, he shows strength. And this is the first of the observations that I see. In, in his weakness on the cross... Jesus revealed his greatness and the extent of God's love for each of us. It's the overwhelming message from these verses. You know, it's very hard for us to grasp 
that someone suffering such a horrific death could represent the depth of God's love to us. But when we understand that the purpose of Christ's death was full payment of the penalty of sin, we can see God's love in the horrific suffering that Jesus went through. It was for us. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages, that is the full and complete payment for the penalty of sinner's death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Because God loves you and me so much that he refuses to leave us in the condition that sin causes. And the only way for him to win us back from our sinfulness was that a perfect, sinless person had to die. And so Jesus put aside all the power available to him as God and became a man, a human male, the perfect sacrifice for sin. So that his death is the full payment for the penalty of sin. For all time. And he did it to win us back to Father. So yes, the cross shows us God's love in action. It's God saying, because I love you. I want you back, and I will do whatever it takes to get you back. Romans 5, 8 says, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. You know, this is why Jesus could hang on that cross suffering like he was and look out at all the mockers and all those who'd uh, who, who had taken him and convicted him and say, forgive them, Father, because they don't know what they're doing. You know, as they stood there mocking him, this, he said those words. And that leads me straight into the second point that I, I, I saw, that he who is mocked as a king is king. Those folk who, who were standing around mocking him included the soldiers, right? Uh, and we can read about that in verses 27 to 31 of Matthew 27. Remember, uh, they said there that they... He was dressed up in a, a scarlet robe. They placed a staff. Excuse me, let me go backwards. Wrong one. Right. Uh, the soldiers dressed him up in a scarlet robe. They placed a staff in his hand as a scepter, a crown of thorns on his head. And they knelt in front of him and mockingly called him king. And later, as we look at verse 42, we see that even the chief priests. The teachers of the law and the elders mocked him. Exactly as Jesus said they would in Luke chapter 7 verse 32. Because what they did not realize, each of them, what they did not realize, is that the one they were mocking as king really is a king. They expected a king who would come and use military might and military power to overthrow the Romans. And instead, they saw a king who did not use physical force, but used love and forgiveness. They had no frame of reference for this. They wanted to see him physically doing things not just hanging on a cross. 
You know, today as we read through the New Testament, we see and we read over and over again that Jesus is the King of all kings and the Lord of all lords, as 1 Timothy 6.15 says. That he is supreme, the creator of everything in Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 to 16. But still, the soldiers and the leaders mocked him as king. If only they knew who they were mocking. And when we refuse to acknowledge him as king, aren't we doing the same? Mm. Horrible question, David. Don't ask questions like that. Mm. See, those of us who know Jesus, those of us who follow him, we know, those of us who know him as our saviour, we know him as the son of the living God. We know him as our brother when we're lonely. We know him as our comforter when we're anxious. We know him as our guide when we're lost. When we choose to follow him, we are one together in Christ. Heirs of the king, as we read in Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. As the children of God, says Galatians 3, 26, we are no longer limited by society's restrictions, whether it be race or social standing or class or even gender, because we are all one together. And here's the great news. We are children of the king. <clears throat> I don't think it sinks in, you know that. You know, it means that when we get to heaven, when we are in God's kingdom, we are princes and princesses of the king. That get, means we get to wear princess dresses. <laughs> Gee, some of us are going to look so cute. Jesus did not choose the way of military power. Instead, he chose to put aside his power and become weak in the eyes of the world. Which is the next observation. He who chooses to be powerless is the most powerful. We see this in verses 32 to 40 when we see Jesus choosing to be powerless, not retaliating by calling down the armies of heaven. As the Son of God, they were available. You know, when I read this verse, uh, these verses, the, the th mental image I, I have in my mind is of the armies of heaven sitting on horses, ready to go, champing at the bit, saying, let us go, let us go rescue him. And Father saying, wait, let him say what he wants. And Jesus never called them. In verses 39 to 40, we read, the people passing by were shouting abuse at him, shaking their heads in mockery. Look at you now, they yelled at him. You said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days. Well then, if you are the Son of God, save yourself and come down from the cross. What they were referring to were words that Jesus said to the Jewish leaders, where he said to them in John chapter 2, verse 19, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. Now, just as an aside, the Romans had a law against the desecration of all temples. And what the Pharisees uh, had undertook to do was they wanted to charge Jesus for breaking that law. And so they, they found witnesses who, who could say to the Romans, this is what Jesus said. But Pilate found him innocent. And yet they still crucified him. Just imagine Jesus hanging on the cross after all that had happened to him. 
And he was unimaginably weak physically. And yet powerfully, he was allowing the destruction of his temple. So he could be raised again in three days' time and fulfill everything required to be our Savior. This was his purpose, and he was determined to finish it. No matter the suffering. You know, Jesus was the first example of our physical body being the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 6.19 says, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. Whilst Jesus was talking about the new temple, his body, the Jewish leaders were stuck in their traditional expectations. And so they were unable to see the truth. And that's what happens when we rely on traditions to discover truth. And we heard all about that during the 40 days. We only find the truth in God's word. Jesus chose powerlessness to bring about the destruction of his temple, his body, so that the overwhelming power of God could be shown at resurrection. And that brings me to uh, my next observation in choosing not to save himself, Jesus saves others. In Matthew 27, verses 41 to 42, the leading priests, the teachers of religious law, the elders also mocked Jesus. He saved others, they scoffed, but he cannot save himself. So, he's the king of Israel, is he? Let him come down from the cross right now. And we will believe him. Jesus was accused of not being able to say himself. He could have. But he chose to forgive and remain on the cross. Jesus had declared his purpose was not to judge uh, anybody, not to condemn the world, but to save it. In John chapter 12, verse 47 when people hear my message and do not obey it, I will not judge them. I came not to judge the world, but to save it. This was his purpose, and he was fixed on finishing it. And the words that he used here, to save, means to be rescued from eternal death. Uh, it's a word that means being made acceptable to God for all eternity. And Jesus accomplished this by choosing not to save himself from the painful torture and suffering, the shame and the curse of the cross. His choice on that Friday means that we can be saved. That was his purpose, to restore us to a right relationship with God. And Jesus' sacrifice leaves us with a choice, a choice that demands an answer. Either we choose to become continual, intentional followers of Jesus in every area of our life. In other words, we choose to be saved. Or we choose to live according to our own desires. In other words, we choose not to be saved. We are either one or the other. There is no middle ground. It's an everyday lifestyle. It's not just a Sunday lifestyle. 
Because we are either saved every day or we are not saved at all. And it highlights the truth for us that the cross was for all of us. The image of the crucifixion of Jesus calls to every Christian heart and it calls us to an overwhelming thankfulness. It calls us to a desire to praise and worship him every opportunity we have. The song we sing that our story is to praise him all day long. That's what the cross does. That's what it calls us to. Because Jesus suffered on that cross. He suffered being separated from God as everyone's sin was poured out on him so that we would not ever have to be separated from God. Because everything Jesus went through, he did to pay the full price for the penalty of our sin. And yet the cross is also a celebration of victory. It's a celebration of Jesus' victory over sin. A victory of, of obedience that defeats sin for all time. It's a victory that reverses the direction of our life when we accept him as our Savior. It was a victory over Satan's kingdom on this earth. And that's what we celebrate when we celebrate Good Friday. The cross reminds us every day of the extent of Jesus' love for you and me. A reminder that even though we were still sinning, God loves us so much that he chose to allow his son to suffer through that terrible torturous death on the cross to give us the chance to choose life forever with him. That's the choice that the crucifixion places before us. You know that every time we share in breaking of bread and communion, that's the choice that faces us. That's what we remind ourselves of. Everything that Jesus went through. And so this morning we're going to break bread together. And so firstly, let's make sure as everybody got one of these communion cups. If you don't have one uh, in the front here, please raise a hand and they'll bring it to you. Right. Uh, once you've ta got your cup, won't you just open it, get the wafer out, hold the wafer. We're going to break bread together. And so, Father, as we, we come before you, we thank you for your word this morning. Thank you for speaking to our hearts and our minds. And as we break bread together, Lord, would you instill in us constant reminder of how great your love is and everything that Jesus has done for us. So as you take this bread, every time you break it, right, remember what Jesus did. His broken body on the cross was for you. And then we struggle to open the bottom half of it. Each time that we drink of the wine, which we drink this juice, we remember the blood running from his wounds as he hung on that cross for us. 
Blood that brings forgiveness and restoration. Blood that brings healing for illnesses. Blood that brings forgiveness for our sins and encourages us to forgive others. Let's drink the wine together. And so, Father, we thank you. Thank you for our time together. Thank you that your love for us was so great that Jesus died for us, each and every one of us. And today we can remember the great extent of your sacrifice, your love, your suffering. And help us, Lord, to constantly remember how close you are to us because you never want to be separated from us. In Jesus' name, Lord. Amen.